If you want to see the fully uncut version of this video with everything I can't show you on YouTube, head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross where you can watch it for just two bucks. I've also got another exclusive video on there about Chicago's terrifying switch problem, which can't be shown on YouTube because it goes against their community guidelines on firearms. Oh, and I also recently sent out a bunch of free empty traplaw herb pouches to Patreon supporters free of charge. So if you want to get my uncut and unreleased videos as well as a chance to get free stuff from me personally, head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross. I would really appreciate your support as recently the sponsors are trying to get me to make my content a bit more PG rated and I know you don't want that. So show some love. Thank you. On December 16th, 2021, a man wearing a $1,500 Montclair jacket, a pair of Nike Jordan 1s that hadn't even been released yet, and a $1,400 pair of Amiri Playboy jeans was walking down the street. Here, he's spotted in his designer fit by a man sitting in a nearby barber shop, who walks outside to exchange words with the well-dressed fellow. Within the space of only a few seconds, the young man wearing the Montclair jacket would pull out a gun and open fire, shooting 24-year-old Oscar Hernandez in the neck and back, and leaving him to die in the middle of a busy New York street. According to the NYPD, the man in the Montclair jacket was Kevin Perez, better known online as K-Flock, the most buzzing drill rapper coming out of the Bronx. But to make matters even worse, only moments before this killing took place, he was allegedly on FaceTime with his opposition, seemingly posting this video to social media, showing the world that he kept a pistol inside that Montclair jacket. So why would somebody wearing thousands of dollars of designer clothes be walking around the Bronx armed and dangerous and ready to kill at the slightest provocation. Well, to understand that, we need to go to the beginning and tell the whole story of Bronx drill music, the latest violent subgenre of hip hop to emerge from the streets of New York City, where young men hailing from some of the most dangerous blocks in the Bronx fight for survival in the streets, with those that do survive making booming rap songs and insulting their enemies, inviting them to come back or spin and get revenge. Some of the least fortunate people coming out of this scene can end up in the grave as young as 13 years old. Much of the drill music coming out of the Bronx is amazing and high energy rap music, guaranteed to get you bopping, dancing or working out with more enthusiasm than ever. But the stories contained within these songs tell the tale of a years long deadly feud between young men growing up in one of the toughest boroughs of New York. This is the story of Bronx Drill. The Bronx is both a borough of New York City and a county of New York State. Northeast of Manhattan and across the river from Queens with Rikers Island Prison nestled in comfortably between the two. The Bronx is home to baseball's legendary Yankee Stadium and the New York Yankees, the Bronx Zoo and Van Cortlandt Park, which if you didn't know, was actually where the big meeting of all of the gangs took place in the classic 70s gang beat em up movie, The Warriors. In fact, the Warriors portrayal of the Bronx as a gang infested nightmare is somewhat accurate. The Bronx itself contains the poorest congressional district in the United States, the 15th, with per capita income in the Bronx regularly scoring as the lowest of the five boroughs. Poverty rates for the area are frequently recorded around 30%. So as a result of the struggles experienced by young people growing up in the Bronx with no support system, it's no surprise that gangs have thrived in the area for decades. Since as early as the 50s, the Bronx has seen gangs running their corners. And the real life fist fighting, pipe swinging gangs that terrorized the Bronx in the 70s would be the real life inspiration for movies like The Warriors, terrifying the local citizens and media, but over time these fist fighting gangs would eventually be displaced by much more violent imported gangs, bringing in a more potent brand of violence and crime from other cities and states in America. You may already know that the blood and crip ideology of Los Angeles would eventually make its way to New York, with Rikers Island Prison serving as a fertile breeding ground for these dangerous ideologies to spread. Sex Money Murder, a famous set of the bloods, would eventually find their way to the Bronx after a gang leader from New York found found himself locked up with another leader of the United Blood Nation that originated in Los Angeles. But make no mistake, the structure of a lot of the gangs that run in the streets of the Bronx are incredibly fragmented and splintered. Many small sets control small areas of the borough, with many intertwining and conflicting alliances dictating who's an ally and who's an enemy on each block. And this goes far beyond a simple battle between Bloods and Crips. Countless other gang sets, including many with a Latin American origin, have a significant presence in the Bronx too. And as a result, the borough's gang politics can be confusing 
quick to change, and deadly. But today we're going to be focusing on the most modern sets of gangs that run the streets in the Bronx, specifically the ones whose members are making the best music. Funnily enough, rap music itself was actually born in the Bronx too. On the 11th of August 1973, legend has it that DJ Cool Herc decided to extend an instrumental beat to let people dance longer, and begun emceeing or rapping over that beat whilst people were breakdancing and having a good time at the party. This innovation was essentially the big bang from which all rap music emerged. And from here, MCs and DJs would spin beats at parties and rap over them. And over the course of the next few decades, this would create a multi-billion dollar subculture that is the rap game as we know it today. A lot has happened between the 1970s and the 2020s. Over time, MCs who had originally started speaking over beats to get breakdancing parties lit would slowly begin using their time on the microphone to share their personal stories. Some of these would be braggadocious songs about the high life, being successful, having big money, and getting to the American dream. While others, less fortunate, would use music as an opportunity to share the struggle and pain that they had been through detailing the dangerous lifestyle that they had been forced to live growing up in dangerous areas. But when it comes to drill music, the most important period to look at is Chicago in the 2010s. And in the early 2010s, nobody was living more dangerously than the Chicago drill rappers. This is where hip hop's drill subgenre would be born, as teenage rappers who grew up in close proximity to gang violence like Chief Keef would make booming songs over hard trap beats with lyrics detailing the shootings, murders, and pain all witnessed on their blocks where they grew up in Chicago at a time when the city was considered one of the most dangerous places in America. But over time, drill music would spread from city to city. And over the course of the 2010s, drill music would become a staple in every large American city with a high crime rate. And rappers all over the country would make themselves millionaires and celebrities off of the back of making songs detailing a dangerous lifestyle from growing up in or around gang activity. But despite being the borough that essentially invented rap music as we know it, it would take close to 50 years from the invention of rap for things to come full circle, as it was only in 2020 that the world would truly embrace drill music coming out of the Bronx for the first time. Finally, the disenfranchised youth of one of New York's most dangerous boroughs would have a voice and a platform, creating music about all of the violence and killings that they had witnessed growing up in this area, and showing many rap fans around the world for the first time the realities of life in the gang-infested streets of the Bronx. So let's take a closer look at the specific street gangs that have spawned some of the most talented rappers in the Bronx, and how they ended up in a deadly feud that has left countless teenagers dead before many of them were even old enough to drive a car. Now, the complete history of gangs in the Bronx is long and complex. So for the sake of simplicity, in this story, we will simply focus on a handful of relevant street crews that have made a significant impact in the recent Bronx drill music scene. However, the formation of these crews predates the Bronx drill scene by many years. Many of the names of gangs that you're gonna hear referenced in Bronx drill music weren't even around a decade or so ago, as they evolved and splintered off from other crews as the result of internal and external conflicts between their members. One early crew hailing from the Cortland Ave area was known as YGFC, or the Young Gunners from Cortland. This crew was a subset of a much larger gang called the YGs, or Young Gunners. The YGs apparently started around 2003 and was primarily based in two project buildings, the Mott Haven Houses and the Patterson Houses, with another set later popping up in the Bronx's River Park Towers, or RPT projects, around 2010. And the leader of the YGs back in the day was a man named Ju Hef, real name Jutha Perez, an occasional rapper as well as a respected street figure. Sadly, however, Ju Hef was not able to keep his troops in the street united for long. Apparently in the midst of a disagreement between high-ranking members, including a man named Melly Mel Baller, would see several members branching off and making their own crew. This would eventually see the Young Gunners from Cortland, or YGFC, breaking off from the YGs altogether and dropping the Y from their name, becoming the GFC, or God's Favourite Children. At a certain point, they became OGFC, or the original Goons from Cortland, before eventually simplifying and settling on OGs, or a original goons. So the OGs, with their beginnings in the Young Gunners from Cortland, naturally hail from Cortland Ave. This area has a reputation as being one of the most dangerous hoods in the Bronx, with three main housing projects generally affiliated with the OGs. Melrose Houses, Jackson Houses, and Morrisania, aka Vietnam. 
These were three notorious blocks known to the authorities for their gang activity, with all three buildings actually being targeted in a 2009 federal indictment named Operation Rotten Apple, which took 37 drug pushers off the streets from these very buildings, charging a total of 53 gang members after a year-long undercover operation. Melly Mel Baller, the OG's pioneer who I mentioned before, formerly of the YG's, would get himself convicted in a big case too. A case which was apparently made much easier by a great deal of self-snitching on his own personal face. Facebook profile. This was a landmark case where apparently a judge ruled that it's legal for a snitch to use evidence that was gained from snooping on friends only Facebook posts. Apparently Melly Mel Baller had written posts on Facebook marked for friends only where he would suggest that he buys drugs in quantities as large as 600 grams and claiming to have had over 100 people killed. Melly Mel would ultimately be convicted, receiving a sentence of life plus 420 months. And sadly for the OGs, while their affiliates were fighting for their lives in court, younger members were fighting for their lives in the streets. On April the 16th, 2012, a large group of YG's members were out drinking. And at a certain point, a debate breaks out over who puts in the most work for the gang. No one could agree who was the toughest, so at a certain point, they decided to settle the argument, head into a rival territory, and go and find some ops. With the YG's walking to the OG's territory in the Melrose houses. And when they got there, they spotted a 16-year-old OG's member by the name of Noah Baller, real name Moises Laura. The YG's proceeded to physically attack Noah in a brutal fashion, around 20 grown men stomping out one 16-year-old boy. Sadly, he didn't stand a chance and was ultimately stomped to death outside of his own building and left to die in a pool of his own blood. Noah's name has been remembered in the streets of the Bronx for both good and bad reasons. With OGs on his side continuing to tribute him in songs and regularly visiting his graveside, while the opposition on the YG side would regularly diss him saying that they smoke him, with the biggest drill rapper from the YGs currently, D Thang even going as far as to post a picture of a bloodstained pair of Air Force One on Instagram telling his followers that these shoes are the Noah's. Anywho, only a year after Noah's death, Ju Hef, the early pioneer of the YG's, would meet a tragic end too. In 2013, Ju Hef was killed by a man called Melvin Davis after a fight in the Tropicana nightclub. After a mass brawl between the YG's and another street crew called Young Flybridge from Highbridge would end with Ju Hef being beaten in the head with a hookah pipe. This left him in a coma and he would sadly lose his life only a week later. The gang from Highbridge while not officially a part of the OGs, were known to affiliate with some of their members, with some believing that the killing of Juhef did have some connection over what had happened to Noah previously. Despite not being responsible for the killing directly, the YG's main rivals, the OGs, would take this opportunity to clown their rivals for losing their leader. Story goes that OGs members even went so far as to urinate on the mural for Juhef, a massive sign of disrespect. Anywho, with Ju Hef out of the picture, the YGs would continue forward, but naturally, the authorities would be keeping a close eye on them. This would eventually lead to two crews, the YGs and the 18th Park Gang, being targeted in a 2015 criminal indictment that would hit 48 Bronx-based gang members. This case would take 22 members of the YGs off the streets, apparently detailing 30 non-fatal shootings, as well as three homicides, including the killing of Noah. A senior YGs member named William Bracey, aka Rail, would get 33 years for his role in that murder. Murder, with another YG's member, Ant Flocker, real name Anthony Reddick, also pleading guilty to taking part in the murder of Noah. Because of their violent behavior in the street, the YG's had attracted a lot of attention from the authorities, and that would continue as the years went on. Another 2016 indictment targeted members of the YG's, charging around 120 people. At the time, this was the largest gang takedown in New York history, and the indictment would accuse the gang of being involved in at least eight murders, including a 92-year-old innocent bystander killed in her own home by a stray bullet. And according to this indictment, over the course of this entire feud, an alleged 1,800 shots had been fired. Frankly, the YGs, the OGs, and other street gangs had the Bronx looking like a literal war zone throughout the 2000s and 2010s. But while the older members were getting put behind bars or losing their lives, a new generation of young gangbangers desperate for the limelight would soon emerge. Hardened by the bloodshed witnessed at the hands of their olders, and inspired by the drill music blowing up over in the city of Chicago. And the YGs and OGs affiliated rappers that would emerge in the 2020s would bring an incredible amount of creativity to the streets of the Bronx. With these young Bronx drill rappers, Rappers, creating viral anthems amid a backdrop of shootings and violence in the borough they grew up in. The most well-known rapper of the YGs in the Bronx is by far D Thang. D Thang is no stranger to spinning blocks, apparently regularly making home visits to his ops homes. D Thang has also been known to go into enemy territories, pressuring the local bodega workers to throw up rival gang signs to entertain his social media following. Ah. 
OGs. OGs out. OGs. OGs. Only OGs can really watch G. Y'all see the face. Do you think G's? I see the face. What am I moving? Names that you might pop up in a YG's affiliated drill video include people like T Mac, Six, Bando G's, and T Dot. Yus G's, Nesty Flocks, Shah G's. You've also got the likes of Ra G's, a 16 year old member who was initially known for a viral clip where he tried to get down an op with a walking stick. In the morning, I want to run down now. Four y'all early in the morning. Look, look. They weave, stupid, suck my. Now clearly there's no love lost between the modern day members of the OGs and the YGs. The YGs who we've just mentioned have big issues with the OGs in the Bronx drill scene, with the main rapper in the area representing the OGs going by Shah EK or Jiggy Man. He's been seen going back and forth with YGs like D Thang on social media extensively, with the OGs sometimes referring to themselves collectively as the Jiggies, with this being a core part of Shah EK's branding. In fact, he's dropped two musical projects referencing this, Jiggy on Jiggy and Get Jiggy or Die Trying, with his track Shoot or Get Shot being one of his breakout songs. He's known to affiliate with the likes of PJ Glizzy and B Dot, but here's where things get a little bit complicated. Because in the Bronx, some street crews are known to double jack, meaning that they can actually be in alliance with more than one gang at the same time, meaning that there are sometimes quite confusing overlaps and alliances between people in different gangs, and it can get confusing. You've got another crew called the OYs that hail out of Sugar Hill, formerly the original Young Gangsters or OYGs, used to beef with the YGFC or the Young Gunners from Cortland. For a period of time, some OGs and some OYs have connected sometimes referring to themselves as OYOGs. In fact, Shari K of the OGs has collaborated with numerous OY rappers from Sugar Hill. In fact, it actually turns out that the top rapper from the YGs, D Thang, is actually engaged in a long and deadly beef with his own cousin too. One of the most famous drill rappers to ever come out of the Bronx, K Flock. And just to make it even more confusing, he hails from another hood that we haven't actually discussed yet, that seemingly have beef with absolutely everybody. Sevside is an area around East 187th Street. Historically, the gangbangers from Sevside have been in alliance with crews from Mount Vernon and Hilltop known as the HTYBs, or Hilltop Young Bosses, or sometimes just YBs. HTYBs being seen mobbing through the streets of the Bronx as early as 2010, with home movies still circulating online to this day, seemingly showing members running their block claiming Sevside or Hilltop, all while hating on their ops and declaring their intention to K or kill any rivals from the 800s, YGs, or OYs. Very YB, Sev gang, I ain't hit the big suit. Yo, man, YB's up, man. Sev's like JJ here, man. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Shout out to my Sev's side. Now, much like the other gangs we've discussed so far, after a decade of beef and indictments, a modern day crew out of Sevside would emerge, with some gangbangers from this area identifying as 700 DOA. This is a crew made up of a mixture of different sub gang sets, like the Mac Baller Brims and Sex Money Murder Bloods, as well as Crip gangs like the Rolling 80s, because you've got to remember that Bronx gang politics is not as simple as Bloods versus Crips. There's a lot of mixed up and overlapping gang sets that you maybe wouldn't expect traditionally to be cool with each other, but some Bloods and Crips might be in alliance under the umbrella of the 700 DOA crew. And to make it even more confusing, 700 DOA from Sev's side apparently identify as EBK or Everybody Killers, meaning that they hate everybody. There might be a few friendships and alliances between some DOAs and OGs, but one thing's for sure, the guys from DOA have furious beef with the likes of the YGs and the OYs, and things can get very confusing and very dangerous indeed. Now, the most famous of the Sev's side rappers from the Bronx drill scene is of course K-Flock. But before he was known for his raps, he was just doing his thing in the dangerous streets of the Bronx alongside a couple of his friends. More specifically, Dougie B and B Love, who actually is OGs, with this trio being Sevside natives growing up on 187th Street in Belmont in the Bronx. Where are you two from and how did y'all get into this music stuff? Okay. Now it was apparently B Love who started rapping first out of this trio. Funnily enough, citing his biggest inspiration in the rap game as Chicago drill rapper turned convicted murderer Rondo Number no. Nine. From here, B Love would end up getting Dougie B and K Flock in front of the microphone with a little encouragement. I'm not, I wasn't really the rapper, it's really the rapper right here. I was <laughs> playing, playing with this rapper. Playing with this shit. I was going to my playing with this side right here, feel right. me? Right. Going to the store, playing for me. And then I started taking it serious. I see you, like, I'm going up for me. Mm -hmm. My son love, like, nah, it's time to go take it serious, for me. Stop playing. 
Little did this trio know that together they would be pioneering one of the biggest musical movements to come out of the Bronx since the 70s. But this would have been hard to appreciate at the time, and despite convincing two of his day one homies to get into the rap game, B-Love himself said that he didn't really see the potential in music initially. It was only after spending some time in prison that he would realise that rapping could be a legitimate way out of the streets upon his release. What was like the moment for you that really kind of made you want to like do this in a more serious manner? I got locked up. Mm -hmm. I got a charge. When I came home, like, nah, like, you gotta keep going. I just started taking shit serious, man. But sadly, through their journey into the music industry, there's been a whole lot of setbacks and backstabs. The guys from Seth's side used to hang out with another rapper called PNVJ, another rapper from their block who was apparently one of the first people in the Bronx to rap over a UK drill beat and introducing Dougie B to the potential of the music industry. How'd you get into music? For me, I'll but like, for me, PNVJ used to be from my hood for me, I ain't gonna lie. He did his own thing, he separated, he's respected it, see, Somebody for me to see another young dirty made it. So it felt like we, us dirty little can make it. But despite being inspired to take music seriously by the success of his peer, this didn't mean that hood politics couldn't still get messy. Eventually, Doggy B and PNVJ would start beefing, leading to an apparent chain snatching, with Doggy B being seen posing with the chain online, which would subsequently lead him to spending some time in jail. It's with the gang. It's with the gang. That's this. No cap. PNV side. PNV side. That's the, that's the, come on. PNV dog, bro. Tell him we got the PNV chain on the set. Shut Tell him call me, G. Come on, shut My flockers is taking your chain. He even said it, you kid. My flockers is taking your chain, you stupid. <laughs> Even K Flock would be seen bragging on Instagram about the chain snatching too. <laughs> Fortunately, Dougie B would find out that his streaming numbers were going up from a jail, realizing that there would be an opportunity for him in the rap game when he got out. Tell my mom and your mom, check, check Kayla, check your YouTube, she like, see you got a million views in less than in like a right before I come home, no, I got to get like for me, I got, I got to get for me when I was in, I was in some program shit, like they get me on YouTube shit, I see this. I'm like, I seen him too, I'm like, nah. <laughs> but sadly, despite seeing genuine opportunities to make it out of the hood through music, internal beefs between the young men coming up as rappers in the Bronx would get more and more complicated and dangerous. While the Seb side rappers had a historical and long-running beef with YGs like D-Thang, there were formerly alliances between crews too. In fact, it seems at one point that Kate Flock was friends with Shah EK from the OGs and E-Dot from the OYs, until an apparent smoking session on IG Live seemed to expose E-Dot would share mutual friends with Kate Flock's op like D Thang and the other YGs. K Flock, apparently upset about the apparent friendliness between his allies and his ops, would be quick to cut people off and fly the flag as EBK or an everybody killer. Now, I've got to say that to me, this sort of thinking really shows just how misguided the origins of some of these street beefs are. With the top comment on the video of that smoking session that apparently drove a rift between these two groups, pointing out how absurd it is that people smoking together on live would lead to a breakdown in friendships, with disappointed fans saying, I can't believe this is the reason that we can't get another Shah EK and K Flock collab or an E Dot and K Flock collab. Now, E Dot would go on to say that he felt that K Flock turned on them out of jealousy over E Dot's budding success in music. Because I'm 15, I was 15 with a million views. I'm about to be 16 with 2 million views. They ain't never do that before. All my ops, 18, 19, 20, 21, I'll be for old, straight old. Word of my mother is asking me for songs, bro. Asking me for songs, wanting to be on songs with me. Be mad because they get, get a feature with me. Word to my life, that's what it all be about. And they try and make it, they they come to the net and try and make it seem like like, like it's something else. It's a whole nother problem. No, you mad because you ain't get a song with me. But K Flock would go on to say, in response to fans saying that Edot made a big mistake being on that live, that he doesn't care because the way K Flock sees it, if a friend smokes with an op by mistake, he can also get shot by mistake. And now he's gunning for Edot and anyone he's affiliated with. You wanna smoke with an op by mistake? You wanna get shot by mistake? What about that? When Edot see me, uh, uh, or my mother, and whoever with him, will have to run with him. Or my mother, I ain't gonna lie. Bro, word of my dad, nothing is stopping me from upping his gun at that little Nothing is stopping me. The cops, nothing, bro. Word of my mother, bro. That little 
gotta have his gun on him when he's seen, whatever. Now look, I agree that seeing an IG live with someone who you thought was your friend, smoking with somebody that's affiliated with your enemy, might be a silly reason for a normal person to end a friendship. But let's not forget that when you're part of a gang, things go a little bit deeper than that. If someone you fought with your friend is with an enemy who says that they're smoking one of your dead friends, that's a bit harder to get past. Furthermore, if you're really that deep in the streets, keeping the wrong friends can be deadly. You can get double-crossed in an instant, and considering just how dangerous the streets of the Bronx can get, getting caught off guard by an enemy or former friend can mean instant death. So now it's time to take a closer look at some of the people who weren't so lucky. Some of the young men who lost their lives before they would really have an opportunity to make it through music or some other way. So let's start off with a name who you might hear referenced frequently in a lot of Bronx drill music. And that name is Wu Lottie. Wu Lottie was a YG's member known for his long-running beef with the OGs. He also rapped having appeared on a track called Falls Talk, releasing in February 2020. Less than two months after that video released, on the 7th of April 2020, Wu Lottie, real name Glenn Cole, was walking with other YG's in Sugar Hill, when around one in the morning they were caught by their enemies. Apparently, a car full of OGs pulled up, taking chase with broomsticks, trash cans and knives. In a terrible stroke of misfortune, Wu Lottie tripped to the ground, with the gang of rivals setting upon him furiously. Not only were they attacking him without remorse, but they were also filming the attack for Snapchat. In a clip that's far too violent to show you on YouTube, a whole mob of people surround Wu Lottie, beating him with weapons. He was left with stab wounds to his torso and thigh, later passing away in Harlem Hospital. Investigation underway in Harlem after a man was stabbed to death. It happened just before one this morning on West 154th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. Authorities say officers found the man with multiple stab wounds to his torso and legs. His identity yet to be released and no arrests have been made. Two people were initially arrested for the murder, a 28-year-old and a 16-year-old, with the older man being quickly identified by police after renting the zip car that the attackers escaped in in his own name, with the cops later arresting five people in total for this crime. Wu Lottie would unfortunately lose his life just as the Bronx drill scene was beginning to rise. Only five days after Wu Lottie's passing, on the 13th of April, B Love would put out one of his first releases, the song and video for No Hook. The track had gritty lyrics about shooters in the streets and homies losing their lives to the light. Style. But this track wasn't the op smoking offensive anthems that we would later see emerge from the area. However, before the end of the month, the YGs would come out with a menacing new song of their own. With T Dot, D Fang, T Mac, E Day, and Six dropping the track RPT Buggin Part 2 on April the 30th, 2020. The track came with lyrics about spinning the op block in Highbridge, killing OG members and saying that they're OG killers or OGK, and dissing a deceased OG's affiliate named Smelly. Real name Es Merlin Toribo, Smelly was killed just age 17. In a dispute over a bike that he had recently sold. Smelly ended up getting stabbed 14 times in the chest during this altercation, tragically losing his life. That song, RPT Buggin, showed the world for the first time the kind of timing that the YG's rappers in the Bronx were on. Unafraid to diss the dead, and willing to bring up tragedies from years ago just to provoke and upset their rivals. But the thing is, while some YG's members were taking big steps in music, over on Sev's side, K Flock had yet to release any music yet. At this point, K Flock was still deep in the streets, spinning the op block on IG Live without a care in the world for who was watching. In fact, in a now iconic IG Live session, K Flock would record himself in 800 YG's territory seemingly hunting for ops, showing the world that he was outside the ops building and ready to shoot, or make a movie as he calls it. Come outside, we in front of our building. Look, we in front of our building. He live in this building, y'all. I feel like a warrior. I'm Dolo. What they gonna tell me? I'm like that. I'm like that. The word of my mother, what? I wish when y'all drink niggas over here, we just shot when y'all niggas in your face, we never went in love. What about mom making a f movie on live? If I got a dog, go what am I? That means that. Well, I'm on a block, Tolo. I'm on a block. I'm on a block. I'm on a block. <laughs> And at a certain point, K Flock seems to spot who he was looking for, but is then immediately spotted himself by the cops. I'm not doing nothing, bro. So Alright. Rats, where the mom? Huh? Look, I'm about to run down. Where my dad? The boys right there, look. Nobody's running! Nobody's running! The f the boys right there! The boys right there, like look! So come back, come around the block! Come around the block! Came more there, boys down, look, boys still down there. Boys still down there. But despite the police presence, K Flock remained on the block, ready for ops and still streaming live, despite the presence of the police. Hold on, look. Yeah, I look. 
I'm a Hunstil. K would even go on in this live to tell his homie that he literally spun the block for views and bragging about the sub 200 live viewers that he had on his live while this was going on. Uh, we gang out here. We just made it 100 like 17 times. Oh, live, look how many views I got. Look, you gonna see for yourself. Oh, this shit oh, flogging. K flogs oh, to myself. Up, man. Oh, geez, up. What am I, mother? To me, this shows just how crazy K-Flock was in the streets before his rap career had even begun. He was a truly lost kid, with zero fear, something to prove, with complete disregard for the safety of his ops, his friends, or even himself. So while the clashes in the streets were heating up, so too were the clashes in the music, as rappers from the OG side of the beef would also begin releasing provocative music with the sole aim of provoking their ops. On May the 1st, 2020, Shah EK, PJ Glizzy, and B-Dot released their breakout song, Shoot or Get Shot, with the main hook of the song Song, basically saying if you represent the YGs, you will get shot, and with lyrics dissing YGs throughout the whole track. And so what with the buzz about Bronx Drill beginning to rise, at a certain point K Flock decides to take a break from spinning his ops block on IG Live, getting in the recording booth and making a little song of his own. And at the end of May 2020, K Flock would drop his first solo track, FTO, a 22G's remix that would begin to blow him up in the rap game too. Now the template had been set. K Flock had a genuine opportunity to build himself a legitimate career as a rapper, but as we see as this story progresses, he would remain heavily invested in the streets, perhaps not even realising just how big of an opportunity he was creating for himself by picking up a microphone. And unfortunately, as the months would go on, both sides would see bloodshed as a result of the deadly gang lifestyle that they were tied up in, ultimately leading to a whole lot of heartbreak, loss and disrespectful music being made. On June the 26th, 2020, Ty Benji, real name Tyron Mitchell Almadova, is sitting in the back of a taxi. At around 11 p.m., a white BMW pulls up. Reports suggested that after yelling something, an occupant of that BMW opened fire, hitting Ty Benji in the head. He would be left for dead in the back of that cab on a busy street. Now, Ty would initially survive that attack, spending several days in the hospital. But sadly, only two days after the shooting of Ty, yet another attack would take the life of another young man, leaving the local community shaken. Just before midnight on June the 28th, 2020, a 17 year old by the name of Brandon Hendricks, known to his friends as Diddy or B Diddy, was apparently at a dice game outside of a building in Morris Heights, on Davidson Avenue near 176th Street. After an argument, he was unfortunately caught in the crossfire with a stray bullet hitting his neck, causing him to lose his life later in hospital. Who just graduated high school was shot and killed overnight in the Bronx. There is overwhelming grief following the death of 17 year old Brandon Hendricks. I just can't believe you. I really can't. Police say he was shot in the neck outside an apartment building on Davidson Avenue near West 176th Street just before midnight on Sunday. After some sort of argument, he died at the hospital. Here outside his home, neighbors say he was a good kid who had big dreams of playing basketball. Diddy was apparently a talented basketball player with a promising future. Killed just days after graduating, apparently he wasn't in a gang, but he did know some people that were involved in that lifestyle on the OGs and the OYs side. As a result, the YGs would mock Diddy's passing on social media, saying things like basketball players need to stay at home, but sadly the tragedies in the streets of the Bronx were far from over. Two days after Diddy's shooting, Ty Benji, who had spent days fighting for his life in hospital, would lose that battle and succumb to his injuries. The Bronx is truly a war zone at this point, and only a few days after this, YG's member Rajiz would be wounded in a shooting just aged 15. Now police say the call came in at 3.30 for a 15-year-old boy shot one time in the back. Detectives working a crime scene at Oakland Place and Prospect Avenue. A police source tells me after the 15-year-old was shot, he made his way around the block towards his home. Police say the two suspects, possibly teenagers themselves, fled northbound on Prospect Avenue on a black and silver scooter. So while the streets of the Bronx are filled with gun smoke, the Bronx drill music scene would begin to show more and more signs of life. On August the 12th, 2020, D Thang of the YGs would become the latest Bronx rapper to rise to mainstream fame off the back of his new song, Caution. This high energy anthem is a Bronx drill favorite, partly because of its amazing beat and D Thang's impeccable flow, and partly because of the dark negativity and disrespect contained within its lyrics. D Thang's song, Caution, is crammed with disses and disrespect. He disses Shah EK, addressing him by his nickname, Jiggy Man. He references their earlier song, Shoot or Get Shot, saying that they're the ones who end up getting shot, an apparent reference to Shah Shah EK being shot by a YG's affiliate, something that Shah EK alluded to in a Talk of the Town interview, which D Thang reacted to personally on his Instagram. It was a rumor saying that you got shot. Is that true? If you know, you know. Mm. You know yeah, you know. we know. Where do my mother we know? Also in caution, D Thang disses E Dot, 
But Dee Thang's disrespect on this song would go much deeper than simply insulting his living ops, and he would go on to reference several people who lost their lives, saying that his ops can go out like Noah, saying that he smokes Benji. But Dee Thang wasn't the only one in the Bronx drill scene upping the disrespect, because the following month on the 6th of September 2020, K-Flock and B-Love would drop their latest drill banger, the song Op Spotter. In the track, both K-Flock and B-Love say that they'll shoot people for bunny hopping, an apparent reference to a dance that Dee Thang and other YGs are known to do. B-Love says that he's smoking on Wu Lotty, and that he screams OGs while rolling through the YG's building. And sadly, as these two sides would provoke each other in music, the deadly consequences of the gangbanging lifestyle would also continue to play out in the streets. On September the 10th, 2020, 17-year-old Kurtha Wurtz, aka K-Dub or Dubski, was walking on the street in Ho Avenue in Crotona. And here, he was confronted by two masked gunmen. He too would attempt to run away, but tripped up, with his assailants getting up close and shooting him multiple times, with K-Dub sadly later passing away in hospital. Loved ones lit candles and shared stories of 17-year-old Kether Wirtz. He was a cool dude, always laughing. He never bothered nobody unless he had to. Uh, yeah, he was just a chill guy. Once again, the whole shooting was caught on camera and broadcast on the news, but again, is way too shocking to show you on YouTube. The cops would later make an arrest in this case, with later unconfirmed speculation suggesting that the killer may have been from Sev's side. But from here, only days later, would there be another senseless killing seemingly carried out by YG's affiliates. On September the 12th, 2020, 23 year old Christopher Pagan, aka Yellow, was in a parked car at Jackson Houses on Park Avenue near East 158th Street in Melrose. Here, a gunman approached his vehicle and opened fire. One man was shot and survived, but sadly, Yellow was hit once in the shoulder and once in the head, leading him to tragically pass away at the scene. The YGs would mock Yellow after his death and begin to reference his name in their songs. Three people were arrested for this crime, two for being the shooters and one for providing the gun to them. Interestingly, the person who allegedly provided the gun in this hit was the younger brother of one of the older YGs who pled guilty for his role in Noah's death. And the younger YG's member, who was implicated in the killing of Yellow by allegedly providing the weapon, actually ended up being caught and confronted on camera outside of a courthouse by B Love himself. B Love, you talking about come across the street? I came to court with it. Why can you throw that up one more time? You talking about? You talking about? Come across the street. Come across the street. Did you talking about? Suck my. He's up. Now, this video was taken by the YGs as a massive provocation against the group, and as a result, it would have only made B-Love and his close friends even more wanted targets for the YGs who were continuing to put in work on the streets. However, regardless of the dangers, with B-Love and K-Flock doing numbers in music, soon Dougie B would also musically put his name on the map too. And it wouldn't take long for this Sevside trio to wind up dominating the budding Bronx drill music scene. After some time spent behind bars, in part because of that chain snatching incident we mentioned earlier, on December the 11th, 2020, Dougie B would make his musical comeback, releasing the fresh home track No More Free Dougie B alongside Shah EK and K Flock. And make no mistake, this track was a straight gang banging anthem, with Dougie B saying that him and K Flock spin with two guns to shoot. Shah EK says that he will kill anybody dropping the O, by which he means flipping the OG's hand sign upside down to show disrespect. He says that he smokes Woo Lottie, and K Flock ends out the song saying that he he kills for no reason. This track really set the tone, with a lot of disrespect going back and forth between these songs. But once again, escalation of the war of words in the music was soon followed by an escalation of violence in the streets. On the 23rd of December, a close friend of K-Flock known as JB, real name James Solano, was standing outside the King Delian Grocery in the Bronx on Boston Road in East 166th Street in Morrisania. While standing here, a man approaches him and taps him on the shoulder. And these two people look familiar with each other. There doesn't appear to be a lot of tension or provocation at this point. However, only a few seconds later, the man who patted him on the shoulder reaches into his coat, producing a pistol and opening fire on JB at close range. This was another terrifying attack caught on video, but once again, way too shocking to show on YouTube. Around a week after JB's murder, a suspect was arrested after being caught by the cops purse snatching. JB was only 16 years old when his life was taken. Yet another tragedy falling on the shoulders of teenage boys who have barely even had a chance to work out their lives yet. But fortunately, even losing their friend JB, this didn't stop his surviving friends from continuing to put their pain on music and progress their careers. Only two days after JB's murder, on Christmas Day 2020, K-Flock and B-Love would release 
released their latest song, Speed Racing, a track all about spinning on ops after taking Xanax and leaving them running away like speed racers. The track also contains similar lyrics about shooting YGs or gunners and killing anyone bunny hopping, as well as lyrics about shooting anyone that throws up YG's hand signs. Slowly but surely, K Flock and B Love's plan was working and their music was on the rise off of the back of their vicious beef in the streets with the YGs and d -thang. But moving into 2021, we would see that beef be playing out on social media more and more. As we get into the new year of 2021, Bronx Drill fans would see d -thang and K Flock hopping on Instagram Live together and arguing about who has the best lean and smoke. You never had this. That's that mud! That's that mud! That's that mud! Stupid, yeah. D-Thang would go on to prod his op, referencing their earlier song, saying that there's no more free Dougie B because he'll soon be R.I.P. and the YGs are going to take his life. No more free Dougie B. I'm cool like that. What am I? What am I? I'm talking like that. What am I? Gangster, gangster. Gangster, I'm going to go attack him. I ain't going to attack Dougie B. Now, not long after this, K Flock would be seen on live, apparently spinning through his ops block once again, the 800 YG's turf. And from here, we would see a reckless K Flock acting wild on live, riding around his enemy's hood, screaming at them not to run out of a window. Run, don't run, like, don't run, don't run. Seemingly, K Flock would eventually catch someone, dissing them from out the window, and even telling the driver to use the car to run them over. That was good. Oh, wow. It was gunning. It was gunning. Oh, why? What? Oh, why? I slapped the shit out you. Tell them why. Tell them 800 niggas that suck my dick. You heard? Hey, yo, you heard? Tell them 800 niggas that suck my dick. Don't run. Don't run. Don't after losing their supposed op in a brief chase, K Flock then claims that they're still on the block and they're not leaving. You still already stripped them. Yeah, I got my job. Man, we're not leaving. Word my dad, we're not leaving. K Flock would continue spinning that block for a couple of minutes, seemingly catching someone again, jumping straight out of the car with his friends yelling, Flock em, and doing all of this whilst wearing an expensive Montclair jacket and diamond encrusted necklace. He right, he right there, he right there, he right there. Where, where? He right there. Don't run! Don't run. Yo, fuck it, Daddy, fuck him! Yeah. Fuck him! Hey, bro, how about this? How about this? Yo, we'll get back in the car. Yeah, but yo, bro, hurry, also come back around. But once again, he failed to catch his op, but would go on to assure the fans if they did get him, they would have killed him and put him in the trunk. If I would have caught him, it would have been. If I would have caught him, it would have been. Bro, dead listen, him. we would have really been in the trunk. Word to my day, would have been yelling. I'll give a f. We don't put him in the trunk for real though. Now, funnily enough, we never actually get to see K do anything illegal or actually catch anyone in these lives. And there's a small part of me that believes that riding around staging this sort of thing would be the perfect marketing strategy for an up and coming drill rapper to cultivate a tough guy image. But whether or not he's doing this for the camera or is just genuinely bloodthirsty, you can't deny that the way that K Flock is behaving in these lives is completely out of control and extremely alarming. It's clear at this point that despite his promising rap career, he's truly on a mission to clash with his ops in the street. And as we now know, it would ultimately be this attitude that would lead to his downfall. But before that could happen, he would be releasing a lot more music. Not content to let the Sevs and the OGs have all the fun on social media, d -thang would also end up going live with K-Flock and co joining his broadcast to yell that they're YG killers and they're smoking dead people. Smoking on Lottie, YG dead. I leave. <laughs> In fact, K Flock, slowly becoming a master of self incrimination, would even use this live as an opportunity to show off live ammunition on camera. Muddy. Yeah, Muddy, don't do that, Muddy. Don't do that, Muddy. Never put it over for my wild, nigga. Even my grandma know that. But K Flock wasn't just going hard on social media because him and his crew were about to drop their biggest track yet. On March the 25th, 2021, Dougie B, B Love, and K Flock would drop their posse cut, Brotherly Love. Another high energy Bronx drill anthem that had all three rappers going hard aggressively over yet another booming UK drill style sampled beat, with each of the three rappers dropping hard verses back to back with no breaks and no chorus. And the music video for Brotherly Love had no shortage of guns and contraband either. And the lyrical content was just as dangerous as 
the set dressing too. In the song, Dougie B announces that they are indeed everybody killers. He says that he's so high that he can see Wu, a reference to Fallen YG's member, Wu Lottie. He says that they're going to catch an OY member and shoot their head off. In K Flock's verse, he openly brags about spinning through the 800 block and shooting. He pays respects to his fallen friend JB. And in the final verse, B Love says that when they spin, they bring women with them too. Something that we actually know to be true from their IG live spinning the block. Brotherly Love was a breakout Bronx drill track, blowing these three rappers up massively, raising their profile to the point where they could no longer be ignored. I come out though, yo, that's a rap. Everybody knows me. I don't even know. It's like this. Yes. They going. Oh, it's it's the whole street. But I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that even as their profiles grew off the back of hit records, K Flock would still be hunting for ops on live in the streets of the Bronx in the weeks following this release. In April, in a live session titled Wire Op Just Ran, K Flock would come on live claiming to have just caught an op and made him run for his life just moments before turning the camera on. Bro, me and my son, see how the chase. Dog, you saw me how about? He said, huh, 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 nothing. Get that ass so angle he took light he got scared i said boom that shit so i'm running right to the cops he thought he was gonna do something because he been in front of the cops what the cops he started running behind the cops and then the cops tried to hop on like bitch suck my dick now, K Flock was acting crazy on this live. At one point, even yelling out that his crew had destroyed the candle lit mural of a fallen member and that nobody had even retaliated yet. Where am I, dead? Finally, the y'all candles ain't that citizen lit on y'all block. Too just recently, times. just recently, you still ain't do nothing to my block. Suck my dick. Frankly, K Flock was just getting worse and worse with these incriminating live sessions. At a certain point, he even begins naming specific cars that his officer are driving and claiming that he's going to come back and shoot the block up, not on live, which is just a very dumb and incriminating thing to say before you do a crime. Huh, ask your man's in that great Nissan on your block. Hey, hung up, we know something. We know the older dude. I'll play it before we come through your block right now. But not all live though. Tragedy would strike once again for the YGs in March 2021, when on the 17th, a young woman named Delilah Vasquez was at an apartment at 3339 Hal Ave in Norwood, only a few blocks away from where she grew up. Apparently, Delilah had been pictured in lives with prominent members of the YGs and had allegedly been close friends with several members. According to the police, following an argument at the property, Delilah would end up being shot in the head, with her body being discovered around 10 minutes past 10 pm. It was reported that after the shooting, a gun was thrown out the window, at which point several supposed blood gang members were seen fleeing the apartment. The news would even point out that that apartment was known as a gang stronghold and suggesting that Delilah was known to associate with gang members. She was taken to the hospital but did sadly pass away of her injuries. A tragic loss that would leave the whole community in shock. If you know something, let the family know! Police found Vasquez in an East Gun Hill Road apartment around 10 p.m. earlier this month. Following the shooting, several people believed to be blood gang members were seen exiting the building. The gun was tossed out the window. Residents expressed concern over blood gang members taking control of the apartment building before the incident occurred. This was an awful tragedy, but to make matters worse, despite not even being a full-blown gang member, the YG's ops, the OGs, would use Delilah's tragic demise as an opportunity to mock and provoke their enemies in the YG's. Only around a month after Delilah's passing on April the 22nd, 2021, OGs rapper rappers Shah EK and Blockwork released the very disrespectful song D and D, which stands for Dummy and Delilah. A scathing diss track aimed towards the YGs, with Shah EK dropping lyrics suggesting that he smokes Delilah, as well as saying that he will also smoke a dummy. An apparent reference to another fallen member, Dumbout, real name Damien Gilbert, who was sadly stabbed to death in 2018. The victim, 18-year-old Damien Gilbert, died at the hospital, stabbed several times in the chest. Now police are looking for a killer. Someone the victim knew. But the disrespect went deeper than the two names contained within the title. Blockwork would go on to say that he was smoking on Lottie and saying that he's ready to kill any flocker. At this point, it begins to feel like the disrespect in Bronx drill music is reaching an all-time high. But from here, the war of words and songs released by both sides would only intensify, spurring on the rivalry even further. <laughs> In the months that followed, the Bronx drill scene would be on fire musically. On May the 10th, KD and K Flock would release their track War, 
A booming drill track all about going to war with your ops, with lyrics crammed with bravado and disrespect. K says that he spins the 800 block with Dougie B, he references Wu Lottie being left behind to die, suggesting that his friends had ran off on him, and K also pays respects to his fallen friend JB. Now with their music buzzing in the streets, it doesn't take long for interview requests to start coming in too. And on May the 21st, K Flock, Dougie B and B Love would appear in an On The Radar interview, speaking for the first time since their glow up, and saying rather prophetically that since gaining fame, they still move the same. Oh yeah, I'm moving a little bit different now that now that the records out. Like <laughs> I'm the same every day. Same. I'm the same. I'm gonna move more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More time. Yeah, like for me, he like, that. that Cause now people see yeah, see your face online. I don't like being like see like yeah. I don't like people all look I only like that. I'm like, Despite still being heavily invested in the streets, K Flock would say in the interview that he now feels like he is truly a famous rapper. I feel like a famous rapper. <laughs> K Flock is also asked by the interviewer why people say he's a menace, with K ironically playing dumb. Why are they saying you're a menace? <laughs> I don't know. I'll be you seem cool. That's what I'm saying. I'll be chilling. I don't know. You seem cool. Yeah, you seem cool. <laughs> When asked by what name they go by as a trio, K Flock says EBK or Everybody Killers. EBK, EBK. EBK. Everybody killers. Everybody killers. That's what I'm saying. Everybody killers. That's what's going to be a bold. EBK. From here, as we mentioned at the start of the story, at a certain point, overlaps between crews would lead to a breakdown of former friendships. In May 2021, Shah E.K. of the OGs posts on Instagram every flock a shot, YGs or not, an apparent diss towards K Flock, giving his former acquaintance yet more reason to identify as EBK or an everybody killer. Meanwhile though, over in the YG studio, more members are picking up steam in the rap game and using their newfound platforms to disrespect their enemies. On June the 4th, 2021, Yus G's of the YG's drops his song Warzone. This would feature disses aimed at K-Flock's fallen friend JB, as well as referencing Noah and Smelly, two of the young men affiliated with the OG's and Hybrid respectively who lost their lives as part of this feud. A little while after this song released, K-Flock would go live beefing with Ra G's of the YG's, confronting Ra G's who had apparently told D-Thang that he had shot K-Flock in the stomach, with Ra G's suggesting that K-Flock is being a snitch for airing out their personal gang business on live. Which what you do, Rob? What am I doing? I might go six, but you want me just coming you in my face? Nah, nah, nah. You know why I don't believe you nothing you say? Because you said, what are your dad? You clap me in my stomach. You over here, you over here capping in your raps. Son. Why you jacking? You shot me in my stomach. Yo, bro, what am I doing? Oh. Word of my mother, I have my cousin on this. D thing even told me. D, that's who, I, that's who told me. My cousin said, you said you shot me in my stomach before. He's gonna get me on IG nigga. with a thousand and five hundred views nigga. say I shot him. Nigga, are you hot? Nigga, you talking about hot? Nigga, it's nothing right? on you my stomach. You want me to say I shot you with a thousand and five hundred views, right? Right. 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 right? What? You, what? Right ass. Right. you never did nothing to me. You never even vote. I ain't gonna lie, this man going to jail. Do you not hear what he say? Fortunately, at this point, K Flock was still putting out music in between his street feuds. At a certain point, taken to the recording booth to pile yet more disrespect on Raji's name, K Flock's June 20th release, What You Will Wanna Do, aka Power, was a big track. The song's name and the sample underlying the UK drill beat was borrowed from Kanye West's classic Power. And in the track, K Flock disses Raji's or Ra Ra, saying that when they saw each other, Ra didn't shoot. He also once again references Wu Lotti tripping up and losing his life. He says openly that he's a demon and that he spins through the Bronx trying to kill, and saying that he will spin with two guns and take the life of anybody who represents OY. Three days after this, on June the 23rd, Rajiz will drop his own song with Nesty Flocks, BTB, responding to K. The track itself is full of disses aimed at K Flock and Shari K, specifically trying to get under K's skin with insults aimed at JB. It's funny that K Flock said in his earlier interview that he feels like he's a famous rapper now, because off the back of the music that he was making, despite still being at least one foot deep in the streets, K Flock was starting to see the spoils of a successful career in music. That same month, K seems to get his hands on a new car, a brand new BMW M4, a nice car which K Flock apparently immediately starts using for sliding on the ops, posting clips online of him driving recklessly and dissing ops from the car. To be honest, at this point, K Flock is really coming across as a live fast, die young kind of guy. But the reality is, the success of the music that he was making was truly giving him the financial means that he needed to get away from the dangerous blocks where he grew up and many of his friends were losing their lives. But Kay's pride just didn't seem to want to let any disrespect slide. On June the 28th, Rajis would tease a snippet to yet another song dissing Kay Flock 
on his Instagram page. And only a few days later on the 3rd of July, his homie, also of the YGs, D Thang, along with Nesty Flocks, would release the incredibly disrespectful song Wedgie Man. With the song's title being a reference to OG's member Shah EK, who'd been seen in a viral clip being given a severe wedgie on social media. This song extensively disses Shah EK, aka Jiggy Man, once again bringing up his earlier shooting. Nesty Flocks would go on to diss other members like Lil Thunder, who had apparently been attacked by Nesty and Rajiz, being tripped up and beaten in yet another clip posted to social media, but is again far too shocking to show you on YouTube. In the track, Nesty also claims to be OG's K, and Dthang would go on to say that he's smoking Noah, Benji, and Diddy, something that you will hear him do frequently in many of his tracks. He'd also go on to say that Shah EK got shot, as well as dissing Edot. In response to this, only a few days later, K Flock would be seen spinning the 800 YG's block once again, but this time it was a much more serious escalation, with this provocation setting into motion a chain reaction that would lead to back to back killings, sparking one of the bloodiest summers that the Bronx had ever seen. A few days after Dthang's latest track, K Flock would go live on IG once again, spinning the 800 YG's block. They're gonna come to win. Right there. Hey, what's up? They don't wanna come out. They know what I'll do. Bro, they bitch, I'm trying to spin. Look how comfortable I am on the block. Don't look cool in there. Basketball players. They so it's about to get lit. <laughs> Grab their basketball and start leaving. <laughs> Immediately after that clip of K-Flock spinning the op block begun to circulate, Rajis himself would then go on live, saying that he is outside waiting for K-Flock to pull up. Somebody tag K-Flock, somebody tag K-Flock. It's not, play him, come right back. It's outside right now as we speak. You coming through hot and all live, block off your lives from see your shit. Like, what's up? Pop out, we outside here. Yo, K-Flock, pop out, pop out right now. Right now as we speak. You wanna make shows, you wanna make shows too. Pop out. Weirdo, huh? Water my mother. Tell Pop out right now. Right Pop out right now. Come up here. Where you at? Like, where you at? Like, you at? Bro. You wear I'm shit. I wish I had a suit. I mean, know the V. I'm we, on y'all. We, we see that. We know the V. We, we, yo. It is pussy. Mm. I know that was done by the very two. They, they see me the other day. They see me the other day. They see me the other day. You wanna go live on my block? Niggas know you on my block. Not worry about you. I'm not nobody love nothing. Bro, I'm getting nigga. hot. On Respectfully, my block, I see you. I see you. Come do something. Say you Come do something. I'm gonna blow his fucking. You a little K, bro. Sadly, from here, the consequences of this war would get very deadly, but not for K Flock. Only a day after K Flock and Ra Ra would go back and forth on social media, on the 7th of July at 11:35 p.m., a 19-year-old rapper associated with the YGs, known as Ty Swish (real name Tyquil Doherty), was passing through the lobby of his apartment block on Prospect Ave near East 182nd Street in Belmont. Here, he was confronted by an assailant who shot him in the eye. He attempted to flee, but his injuries were too much, and he would collapse outside of his own building. A situation made even more tragic by the fact that he was found unconscious on the ground by his own mother. Ty was rushed to hospital, but would sadly lose his life. 19-year-old Ty Quill Dougherty was killed in this shooting. He was shot in the head and lived in this apartment building. He seemed to be walking in the doorway when he was shot in the head and killed. A retaliatory attack would take place only four days later, with the target shockingly being a 13-year-old boy by the name of Jarian Elliott, known on the streets as J-Rip or J-Rip K. He was a young affiliate of the Cribs from Sevside, and according to the police, he was at the scene of Ty Swish's murder days before, as well as having recently been seen on live with other guests. Gang members. At around 3.15 p.m. on July the 11th, 2021, a black sedan pulled up to 743 East 187th Street near Prospect Avenue, with a gunman hopping out the back seat and opening fire on two boys standing on the street. With CCTV surveillance footage capturing a man firing across the street in broad daylight. One of the targets of the shooting managed to flee, however Jay Rip was struck once in the chest and once in the ankle. He would attempt to find safety crawling into the nearby Angel's Cafe, as panicked customers crowded around and tried to save his life. With the entire ordeal being being caught on video and broadcast on the news, but once again is too shocking to show you on YouTube. He would sadly lose his life en route to the hospital, being pronounced dead on arrival, with this situation being made all the more tragic by the fact that he would lose his life only weeks before his 14th birthday. Police marked multiple shell casings inside and outside Angel's Cafe as they gathered evidence throughout the evening. Surveillance video from across the street captured some of that chaos as an ambulance brought the young victim to the hospital where he would be pronounced dead and was identified as 13-year-old Jarion Elliott. Outside his building tonight, candles glow in the shape of his initials, J.E. Following his death, 
the news circulated an image supposedly showing Jay Rip holding a handgun. The news would report that despite being the young age of 13, he was already a member of the rolling 80s Crips, with the New York Post reporting that he had already been arrested eight times despite only being 13. They would point out that he was specifically the intended target of the attack. And I've just got to say, it's truly shocking to think that anybody would get out of bed in the morning and go and hunt down a 13 year old with a pistol. Jay Rip was apparently a close friend of K-Flock, with K later posting throwback clips of them apparently play fighting. Don't you supposed to be my man? Nah, why you talking like that on Facebook, bro? I bomb what I put no, on your bro, and what I put no. on your time on. What? And what I put on your timeline and say, oh, happy new year, big bro. Right, YGs like D-Thang would later go on to say that they're smoking J-Rip in songs and on social media. But even worse than that was Shah G's, who apparently went to the site of this killing, completely destroying Jay's mural and recording the whole thing for social media. An unnamed 16 year old was later taken into custody for this crime, with it being rumoured to be a young YG's member by the name of Dolo G's. He had apparently been accompanied on this hit by Ra G's himself, but it would take the cops around a month to pick up Dolo for his involvement in the shooting. But unfortunately for Ra G's, the police wouldn't be able to catch up with him before his enemies could. It was said openly in the news that Ra G's was a member of the YG's and apparently present at the killing of Jay Rip, and if the police knew this, then the ops certainly did too. And apparently, less than 10 hours after the killing of Jay Rip. On July the 11th, 2021, a 16 year old Rajis, real name Ramon Gil Madrano, was on the way to a recording studio. At around 11.35 p.m., he found himself sat in the back of a cab at East 187th Street and Valentine Avenue in Mount Hope. And it was here sat in the back of a cab when he is ambushed by two young men on scooters who open fire into the car, shooting him in the head and chest, leaving him dead instantly. But to make things even more shocking, the cab driver's CCTV passenger camera was on at the time of the hit, capturing Raji's assassination in full HD with audio. A truly shocking clip, which once again is far too violent to show you here. Overnight, a boy murdered in the back of a taxi in the Bronx. Police say two suspects riding on a scooter opened fire on the cab, killing the 16-year-old in front of the driver who was not hurt. Raji's lost his life at the hands of two teenagers with guns on scooters. But what's crazy, that this was just a year and a couple of days on from when Raji's had been shot in the back after once again being caught by teenagers on scooters. And this is less than a day after he had allegedly played a part in taking the life of a 13-year-old boy. In less than a week, three youngsters involved in this feud would lose their lives to violence. For me, it's honestly hard to believe that anyone between the ages of 13 or 19 have any idea or appreciation of the dangerous lifestyle that they've been born into at this point. Even despite some of the bad things that the youngsters involved in this story and who were targeted in these killings had allegedly done, I honestly just have the utmost sympathy for them all because they never really had the proper guidance or choice to avoid such a terrible outcome at such a young age. No matter what they've done, they or their families just don't deserve to go through this and it's very hard to place the blame on a 13 year old who's been sucked and groomed into the gang lifestyle for what happened to him. From here, surviving members like D Thang would mourn the loss of his friend Rajiz, with other members making long posts on social media mourning the loss too. Meanwhile, the ops like K Flock, who had just been beefing with Rajiz only days before his killing, would brag that they're smoking on Ra Ra, with others tagging K Flock's music specifically to taunt and mock Rajiz and the YGs. Others would point out the fact that Rajiz had apparently said on social media that he'd been smoking on Jay Rip after his death, with some suggesting that now Rajis would get the opportunity to meet Jay Rip. Moolah G's would later rap in a leaked track called Shake It with a fire beat sampling Akon's Bonanza, referencing Rajis being left dead in the car. Bori 300 would rap on the same song that Ra Ra caught a headshot, with Dougie B going on to say that people can talk on Jay Rip, but look what happened to Ra Ra, suggesting that they're smoking him like the weed strain Zaza. Anywho, these back to back slayings were massive news in the Bronx community. The New York Post pointed out that the Bronx shooting rates had doubled between 2020 and the same period in 2021, with there apparently having been at least 380 shooting victims in the year up to that point. They reported saying that these kids were antagonizing each other on social media and then carrying out revenge shootings in real life, with a police source saying that they simply can't keep these young kids in jail, citing an apparently soft catch and release policy for juveniles, suggesting that youngsters that aren't of age yet are the perfect recruits to carry out older gang members bidding. And it's details like this that genuinely just increase my personal sympathy for the young teenagers that are losing their lives as part of this war. Because they really are often just being groomed into the gang lifestyle by older criminals from their neighborhood at a young age when they really don't know any better. It's truly unfair that some of these communities in the poorer areas of the Bronx have young people growing up with a complete lack of positive role models and as a result through 
no fault of their own, they're being groomed and pressured into a violent gang lifestyle that they might not fully appreciate until it's too late. Fortunately, music is providing a route for some of these young men to build legitimate careers and get out of the cycle of violence once and for all. And so, in the month that followed the bloody summer in the Bronx in 2021, it would appear that K-Flop would cash in massively off of the back of the anthems that he was creating about living this dangerous lifestyle, landing him the opportunity of a lifetime that sadly, he seemingly would go on to squander. The week after Rajiz was murdered in the back of a cab in the Bronx, K-Flock would be seen on social media lounging by a pool far from the deadly war on his block back home. It would appear that K-Flock had been travelling to meet various major record labels that were interested in signing him, with rumours swirling that he had eventually inked a deal with Capitol Records allegedly worth as much as $3 million. The major record labels had seen the meteoric rise of drill music in other cities in the United States, New York included, with the rise of Pop Smoke and the Brooklyn drill movement creating massive profits for the label that signed him, regardless of whether or not he was even alive to see his success. In fact, with the recent massive success of posthumous album releases, it seems that for a lot of these major labels, a dead artist is way more profitable than a living one. But that's a whole other video. Anyway, a month after being spotted out of state, supposedly signing a big money record deal, on August the 16th, 2021, K-Flock would release one of his biggest songs to date, Is You Ready? Sporting licensing info that would confirm to the industry that K-Flock's music was now the property of UMG on behalf of Capitol Records. And this Capitol Records assisted banger was Bronx Drill in its truest form. Is You Ready is a lyrical onslaught and one of the most aggressive drill tracks to come out of the city. K starts the track yelling that he is going to shoot and kill every single op. He says don't run, don't trip in an apparent reference to K-Dub or Dubsky, who was shot by masked gunmen while attempting to flee in September 2020. But it was the disses aimed at his own cousin D-Thang of the YGs that would make this track stand out to a lot of people following this beef. Because the opening line of K-Flock's verse would be so savage, it would become one of the most iconic and dark lines in Bronx Drill history, with K-Flock saying, I could do him like Ice did Sonny. This is a reference to the movie Paid in Full, where Ice, Sonny's uncle, sets him up to be kidnapped and killed. K-Flock is essentially referring to his own relative and cousin D Thang, saying that he would set him up and kill him just like happened in the movie. From here, he would go on to drop a number of foreshadowing lines, referencing his habit of carrying and shooting guns whilst wearing designer clothes, shooting ops in public, and going on to diss Edot saying that he ain't on nothing along with a gunshot ad lib. K-Flock would even swear on J. Rip K's life that he had his ops ducking from gunshots. Flock would ironically go on to say that his ops should stop putting names in their songs, despite having insulted several people by name in the lines leading up to this. He even says that women can get shot in this beef, an apparent reference to Delilah and other females who have been caught in the crossfire during this deadly feud. Now, this song made a huge splash in the Bronx drill scene, but the majority of the attention was on that lyric where K-Flock essentially says that he would smoke his own cousin D-Thang, with many people in complete disbelief that somebody would publicly declare an intention to take the life of their own cousin. This bar was getting so much attention that even D-Thang would go live after the song dropped, addressing the lyric in comical fashion, suggesting that there's going to be an awkward conversation with his auntie now. He ain't related to me. Like I did this son. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see auntie now. Huh. Just gonna learn today. I ain't gonna lie. Tell nigga stop playing with me bro. Gangsta bro. Clearly, the war of words between these two sides was escalating by the minute. And now, seemingly encouraged by a major record label deal, the more disrespectful the music was, the more money there was to be made. And this would only encourage more responses and disses from every side of the war. On August the 19th, 2021, CJ Goon releases his song, How You Every O Shot, with the main concept of the track calling out ops for claiming responsibility for every OY or OG's member who's been shot as part of this war. They'd go on to say that they're going to kill D-Thang and Drilly Bop or dance on his coffin. Shari K says, that they're always going to diss Wu Lottie, and another O affiliated rapper named 30 says that he's smoking Wu Lottie too. A few days after that song drops, on August the 24th, Raji's posthumous song called Real Facts releases. And despite Raji's having lost his life, this track that's filled with K Flock disses and dead op smoking is still released, just showing that for even people that had already lost their lives as part of this war, the disrespectful music that they leave behind, dissing the other side, is still weaponized to provoke their ops, even if they're not here anymore. However, it would be the following month when perhaps perhaps the most provocative song in Bronx Drill history would be released. After being publicly dragged by his cousin K Flock, D Thang would get into the studio and cook up a diss track with a famous sample that was bound to get attention. Combining a very well-known and famous song with incredibly disrespectful lyrics that was so offensive, many people said that this song was the Bronx version of Who I Smoke. On September the 21st, D Thang would drop his song Opponent, his own remix to Kanye West's Power. 
This wasn't the Who I Smoke contender yet, but just a quick warm-up. And Dthang's first opportunity to respond to some of K-Flock's comments in his track Is You Ready. Dthang dropped lyrics saying, I know he my cousin and I love him to death, but I just don't give a F. K-Flock, unimpressed by this response, would mock Dthang in an Instagram comment, reposting those lyrics along with a laughing face. But that song really was just a warm-up for the main event. Because on September the 28th, 2021, Dthang and the YGs would release their song Talk Facts, a track which uses a booming UK drill beat along with a sample of the famous song Somebody I Used to Know by Gautier. This beat was incredible, and if you know the sample, it's immediately recognisable. But just like the ATK rappers from Jacksonville had used the catchy sample of Vanessa Carlton's A Thousand Miles to get everybody singing along with lyrics all about dead ops, Dthang did the same thing, using this sample to deliver an onslaught of offensive and disturbing lyrics aimed at his rivals. The track had Dthang and his goons yelling to suck his D in the background throughout the song that literally made me feel like I was standing on a Bronx street. He would use his regular catchphrase, never put an O before his his Y to diss the OYs and OGs. He rebuffed CJ Goon's earlier lyrics, threatening him on the track How You Every O Shot. He says once again that he's smoking on Yellow, Noah and Diddy. He disses B-Love and Shari K. He disses numerous deceased people from Highbridge. He says he's trying to kill OY members and Jiggies, aka OGs. He says he's smoking Ty Benji. He says anybody that's YGK will be put in a box. And then in the second verse, Band OGs says that they're shooting and stabbing OGs. He disses Fallen member Benji and even says that Shar EK's sister got shot, saying that if that was him, he would have retaliated already and be wearing prison shoes right now. And then on verse 3, T-Dot names numerous ops that he claims have been beaten up. He says that he's looking for block work, a rapper from Sugar Hill who claims OY. He says that he'll shoot CJ Goon and he doesn't care if they're cousins either. He also disses Fallen Rivals, Diddy, Benji and UE, and Dougie B claiming that he was shot. Now, this song was a huge helping of disrespect, but the song was huge. Today, it's one of the most viewed Bronx Drill tracks ever, sitting comfortably over 10 million views which isn't bad, especially considering that the producer doesn't seem to have officially cleared the sample on this beat, as Talk Facts is nowhere to be found officially on Spotify. And it's entirely possible that Dthang made absolutely no money off this track. But regardless, the song cemented Dthang's place as a leading voice in the Bronx drill scene, all seemingly without any major label support. But as the war of words continued on the tracks, so too did it continue in the streets. And only a day after Talk Facts was released, another young man associated with the Bronx drill scene on K-Flock's side would lose their life again in the most tragic circumstances circumstances. On the 29th of September 2021, a rolling 80s Crip affiliate, 16-year-old Nas Roller, real name Naziah Sanchez, who had allegedly mocked the deceased YG's member Rajiz in a Facebook post, was standing on a busy street with another man on East 187th Street near Prospect Avenue, just across the street from where J-Rip had been killed. In the middle of the day at 12.50pm, two men jumped out of a Honda Accord, opening fire, shooting him in the head and chest. Nas would lay in the street surrounded by shocked members of the public and emergency medical staff who would desperately try and save his life. But they were sadly unsuccessful, with Nas later passing away in St. Barnabas Hospital. But to make things worse, this incredibly tragic scene was recorded by members of the public and posted to social media, showing the awful extent of this brazen attack in front of dozens of members of the public, a clip that's once again way too raw to show you here. This was a truly disturbing scene, and much like other stories I've covered surrounding Chicago Drill, where brazen assassins would kill ops in broad daylight, one of the sadder and overlooked consequences of this is that dozens of members of the public are forced to witness these heinous crimes being left traumatized in the process, driving home just how little care there is for human life and the welfare of others when it comes to these deadly gang wars. After Nas passed away, k Flock would pay tribute to his fallen friend. However, his enemies would be less caring, with some people circulating Nas's earlier post, mocking the fact that Rajiz can no longer answer the phone, suggesting that Nas also now can't answer the phone. Dthang and other YGs would go on to mock Nas on social media following the news. We smoke it, Nas! Yo! <laughs> with Dthang even going as far to make a post suggesting that Nas had been sacrificed, with others making posts tributing Rajiz, and in case this wasn't obvious enough already, this really isn't anything to glorify. We've got teenagers on both sides celebrating the deaths of 16 year old kids. The cycle just never seems to end. One minute you've got one side mocking the death of Rajiz, while others are mourning him, and with only a few months those who were mocking Ra are mourning Nas, and vice versa. It really is a vicious cycle with no winners. And at this point in the story, the one person with the best chance of making it out of this alive is K-Flock with his success in music truly being the golden ticket out of this dangerous environment. However, as we'd soon find out, even with his record deal, the fame and the money that comes with it, he would remain far too close to the streets even with his newfound success, ultimately putting himself in a compromised situation that could lead to him losing everything. K-Flock was supposed to go industry, 
but sadly, he remained in these streets. Only a month after the tragic loss of his friend Nas Rolla, k -Flop would find himself in a very different environment to the street beefs that he was used to, being invited to play at the 2021 Rolling Loud show in New York. However, in the lead up to this appearance, k -Flop had been going back and forth with another Bronx rapper called Ron Suno. Less of a gangbanger and more influencer turned rapper, Ron Suno had been claiming that he was the first person in the Bronx to start rapping over UK drill inspired beats. With a viral Instagram story circulating in the lead up to this, where Ron Suno appeared to disrespect other Bronx drill artists, suggesting that they owe him for starting this current trend that all the Bronx drill rappers were benefiting from. And well, when these two bumped into each other backstage at Rolling Loud, despite being at a legitimate and professionally organized festival, essentially at work, at a place of business, professional artists being paid professional fees to perform at a professional music festival, both sides decided to lower the tone and bring some Bronx street shit to this legitimate environment. With the confrontation between these two and their entourages escalating, after a punch was thrown, before you know it, it was an all-out mass brawl backstage at Rolling Loud, with the NYPD themselves even struggling to break up this huge fracas. After the incident, K-Flock would post numerous times to his Instagram story, claiming to have beaten the poop out of Ron Suno and his crew. Now, he might not have realized it because he was too busy trying to play the tough guy, but this was honestly a really bad look for K-Flock. This was one of his first big opportunities in the mainstream rap game. And what does he do? He ends up in a massive brawl, likely never getting booked to play Rolling Loud again. And this shows just how wild he was continuing to move at this point in his career. The only problem is his antics were just making him more and more popular. Many people hadn't even heard of K-Flock until they saw the viral clips of that mass brawl going on backstage at Rolling Loud. And as the days went by, K-Flock just continued to go more and more viral, with his name rapidly becoming part of the mainstream rap conversation. And much like rappers coming out of the Brooklyn drill scene before him, K-Flock was also hitting the mainstream and going viral with his amazing dance moves. His getting sturdy dance move, a trend first brought to the masses by the likes of Pop Smoke, but taken to the next level by K-Flock would become hugely popular on TikTok. And a compilation of his most sturdy moments, uploaded to YouTube in November 2021, would prove that there was more to K-Flock than just dissing the ops, and a lot for fans to love. And off the back of all of this attention, K-Flock and his team would capitalize and continue building momentum for his music career. On November the 5th, he drops his hotly anticipated DOA mixtape, much boosted by the release of the remix of his track Being Honest, that came with a guest appearance from Chicago drill legend G Herbo. But at a certain point, if you're known for gang activity and things start going a little bit too good for you, it doesn't take long for the cops to start looking into your situation. Eventually, K-Flock's movements would attract the attention of of the NYPD, who probably weren't the biggest fans of Bronx Drill at this point. In the weeks that followed, multiple Bronx Drill rappers would find themselves in hot water with the police. In fact, on November the 14th, 2021, both K-Flock and D-Thang would find themselves being picked up by the law, with D-Thang catching a gun charge and being sent to Rikers Island, all while K-Flock was getting arrested the same day for apparently having a gun in his shoe in a scene that was caught on camera and uploaded to social media. Are y'all going crazy like that, huh? So it's all, y'all wild it out. Huh? You got a gun in this. Free the flock, man. Free the flock. You rally, man. After both rappers found themselves behind bars, D Thang would call in from jail, telling listeners that he was high off Noah, seemingly still able to access high grade smoke from inside a jail cell. Yeah, Noah's going on, man. Bring me up the fing rock. What's going on? And I'm smack right now. What am I doing? What about smack? I ain't gonna lie, I'm smack. D Thang would eventually bail out on a $200,000 bond, around the same time that K Flock would also be released. And you'd think with all of this extra heat and attention, K Flock would keep a low profile. But no. After getting out, K Flock is seen whipping a Lamborghini Urus, apparently spinning the block looking for D Thang after he made bail. And a day after this, seemingly in response, YG's, Kev G's, and Yus G's would also be seen on social media apparently spinning through Sev's side. The Nazi dad, the monkey gone, like I'm on a strip, like. Now, this wouldn't be a great look for either side, with it likely bringing even more police attention to them. Within a week of these clips coming out, on December 4th, D Thang would be arrested once again after a traffic stop, and this time bail would not be an option. So while his top op was locked up in Rikers Island, K Flock would be out free and living the high life continuing to drive recklessly in that Lamborghini truck and filling his trunk with designer goods from Louis Vuitton and yes, Amiri. Sadly, it would be k Flock's Amiri jeans that would come back to haunt him. And that very designer drip that he'd been so proud to flex would make him the key suspect in a brazen broad daylight murder that would take k Flock off the streets at the very height of his career.
On December 16th, 2021, K-Flock is walking with a woman through Sugar Hill, the OY territory. This is actually only one block away from where E. Baby filmed the Ready For War music video. And just before this incident took place, K-Flock was allegedly on FaceTime with one of his enemies and seemingly posting to social media that he has a gun in his Montclair jacket sitting in the exact spot where a scene from that Ready For War video was filmed. According to 1090 Jake's video about this situation, the video of K-Flock with the gun in his coat was filmed literally around the corner from where the following incident took place. Because seemingly moments after that video, K-Flock would walk around the street where he would be spotted by O.Y. Walker, real name Oscar Hernandez, who sees K-Flock walking down the street in his designer outfit, exiting a barbershop and confronting him. The security footage that's currently available doesn't show exactly what happens next, but only a moment after confronting the man in the designer outfit, the victim appears to be shot, flying back into the frame and landing on the ground Ground with incredible force. Once again, this part of the clip I can't show you in this video. Hernandez had been shot in the neck and back, and he would later pass away in Mount Sinai Hospital. Following the killing, people began to pay respects to O.Y. Walker on social media, unaware that the most famous rapper in the drill community might just be the one responsible. E.Dot would go on to post mourning the loss of Walker and updating his IG bio with a tribute saying everything for Wasker. And from here, naturally, the police would continue investigating this killing. And unfortunately for the shooter, their expensive and unique designer fit was captured in 4K on surveillance video. And only a day after the incident, the police would release an image of the suspect wearing that expensive outfit. 4.52, the NYPD has released surveillance video of a suspect wanted in a deadly shooting in Harlem. The incident took place yesterday morning on 151st Street and Amsterdam Avenue. According to police, Oscar Hernandez was inside a barbershop and the victim went outside to confront him. He was fatally struck in the neck and the back. He was later pronounced dead at Mount Sinai Hospital. It was only a matter of time before they would piece everything together. Soon after this, K-Flock was identified as the alleged shooter and a wanted poster with his face and name was issued citing second degree murder charges. A social media post circulated seemingly showing K-Flock trying to get any outstanding recording done before he goes away for a while. And then on December the 23rd, K-Flock would surrender to officers at the 30th precinct. At this point, the NYPD would confirm that their well-dressed murder suspect was indeed in custody, only two minutes away from where the shooting took place. K-Flock's ops would react to the news of him catching this serious case, saying they hope he gets home soon so they can catch him. Hey, yo, free that man, y'all heard? Bro, that's free that shit, man. We see that man. That's 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 I don't wish that, but we going up. You heard, Muddy? Bro, Daddy, I want him to come home. Yeah, I want him to come home, son. Flock that man. Cool, However, fans of K-Flock on social media were much less forgiving. Considering the privileged position K-Flock was in off of the back of his music career, many people couldn't understand why a famous rapper wearing an outfit worth thousands of dollars would do such a senseless and sloppy crime. People were saying K-Flock is the dumbest criminal in history. Tweets came out questioning why anybody would slide on an op in a Miri jeans, a Montclair jacket, and unreleased Jordan sneakers. Some joked that they simply couldn't believe that somebody would wear a $3,000 outfit to do a drill, pointing out the irony in his earlier lyrics about still toting a pistol whilst wearing designer high fashion. Others suggested that they just couldn't believe that this had happened right next to a church at 10 in the morning, suggesting that K-Flop would have barely finished his breakfast before committing the crime. DJ Academics would come out with an array of nicknames for K-Flop, including the designer demon, the Montclair menace, and the Amiri assassin. Meanwhile, Adam 22 of No Jumper would mourn what a waste of talent this story truly was, pointing out that days ago, K-Flock was the hottest up and comer in the rap game, and all of a sudden he's thrown it all away in a heartbeat. Things weren't looking good for K-Flock. However, his lawyer did at least try and put a positive spin on things, saying that he's begun his own investigations into the killing, and pointing out the fact that the NYPD had received a tip that someone else is the shooter. However, the validity of that claim is yet to be seen, and at this point, the surveillance footage is incredibly damning. And in the meantime, K-Flock would find himself locked up in jail waiting for an update on his case. But if you thought catching a murder charge and being sent to jail at the height of your career would be a humbling experience warranting some self-reflection, then you ought to think again. Because after arriving to jail, fighting for his life and career, it would appear that K-Flock was still on demon time, soon releasing a jail freestyle recorded on the phone where he disses his cousin D-Thang, who's still locked up at this point, suggesting that he got jumped in jail. In response to this, D-Thang would come out with his own freestyle recorded over the phone, from jail, responding to and rebuffing K-Flock's lyrics. K-Flock, why you lied on the net? They said I got hot, you know that shit cat. And for what, we gon' get to the fact you saw me face to face and you wasn't on that, like, so I wanna know. 
Cause you got here like three days ago. Like who did you touch? Like who got can't talk too much, forgot I'm on his phone. After this, more posts would come out where Dethang would deny being attacked in jail, but many people simply could not believe that these two would continue beefing from behind bars as if nothing had changed. Legend of Brooklyn Drill Fabio Foran would even come out to comment after listening to these two jailhouse drill disses, saying jokingly that he loved this newly invented genre of jail phone drill songs and claiming that this is the only genre of music he listens to now. I ain't never seen do the do the jail phone, jail phone um, drill diss joints. I ain't gonna lie, I'm jacking the jail phone diss joints. I'm, that's, for, matter of fact, from now on, the only music I'm listening to is jail phone drill music. I'm not listening to no other type of music. Fabio's right. This is definitely a first for hip hop, but it really does just sum up the broken mentality of these two young men. For better or for worse, they're so motivated and obsessed with this street beef, which is understandable considering just how much bloodshed there's been on both sides, that ultimately fame, money, cars, and designer clothes, or even one's own freedom is inconsequential, when their only motivation is disrespecting, hurting, or killing their opposition. Nothing else matters but getting down the odds, and they don't even care if that's their own flesh and blood. At this point, ultimately their hatred for each other seems so deep that it's hard to imagine that these young men could ever mature and move on from this, pointing their focus to other more important things in life, like their careers, making incredible art, or looking after their families. And sadly for K-Flock, he appeared to have had the clearest and biggest opportunity to break that cycle, but unfortunately that simply wasn't enough for him to change his ways and break the cycle. There's overwhelming grief following the death of 17-year-old Brandon Hendricks. Outside his building tonight, candles glow in the shape of his initials, J.E. Police say he was shot in the neck outside an apartment building on Davidson Avenue. He died at the hospital. He was just a chill guy. Loved ones lit candles and shared stories of 17-year-old Kether Wirtz. Now, police say the call came in at 3.30 for a 15-year-old boy shot one time in the back. A police source tells me after the 15-year-old was shot, he made his way around the block towards his home. Police found Vasquez in an East Gun Hill Road apartment around 10 p.m. earlier this month. The victim, 18-year-old Damien Gilbert, died at the hospital, stabbed several times in the chest. 19-year-old Ty Quill Dougherty was killed in this shooting. He was shot in the head and lived in this apartment building. He seemed to be walking in the doorway when he was shot in the head and killed. Surveillance video from across the street captured some of that chaos as an ambulance brought the young victim to the hospital where he would be pronounced dead. Overnight, a boy murdered in the back of a taxi in the Bronx. Police say two suspects riding on a scooter opened fire on the cab, killing the 16-year-old in front of the driver who was not hurt. Justice for the Lila! Justice for the Lila! I feel like I could have a heart attack and die. Like, this is crazy. Like, it's unfair. A New York Post article breaking down the three back-to-back -back killings in summer 2021 had a quote which said, everybody is walking around with a gun because they're more afraid of getting shot than getting arrested. And this really drives home the no-win situation that these kids in the Bronx are in. Sure, K-Flock had a bad attitude and just seemed itching to catch a body, but other teenagers being born into these dangerous areas and situations are really not getting a choice. If you're born in an area surrounded by gangs, perhaps you might truly feel that there is no alternative but to fit in with that culture, to survive. You're then forced to make the choice between carrying a gun and risking jail or a case, or remaining unarmed and waiting until it's the day that you're the one caught lacking and put on the news. An awful situation and an impossible choice. The whole thing is an unfortunate cycle with no end in sight. Then combine that with the fact that some of these kids being sucked into the gang warfare are literally children, teenagers, as young as 13. It's likely many would have been groomed by older members to do crimes as a juvenile to protect themselves, because the risks and consequences for using kids to carry guns and carry out attacks is so much lower. If the only older role model from your area puts a gun in your hand and tells you shoot or be shot, do you really have a choice? Is it even possible to know any better? A lot of these young children in the tougher areas of America are really lacking the guidance and role models that they need to know better than carrying out these senseless acts of violence. At the end of the day, these are children. I know he claimed to be a tough guy and was really in the streets like that, but it's hard not to look at a picture of Rajiz and really just see an innocent teenager behind all the toughness. Many of the youths we've discussed losing their lives in this story had their whole lives ahead of them, with it being taken taken away in a split second as a result of being tangled in a deadly war that many of them may never have even had a real choice of participating in. And as a result, I've got a lot of sympathy for those on both sides. There's nothing glorious about the gang lifestyle. J-Rip was only 13 when he lost his life. That's not glorious. 
Even though the news described him as a young gang member and the intended target of an assassination, at age 13 there is just no way that you have a true appreciation of what you're getting yourself into. It's unfair to say that he deserved it, or he could have even appreciated the risks that he was growing up around. I personally look at everybody involved in this story, the killed and the killers, as victims of a much wider problem. Because at the end of the day, everybody involved has been forced to do evil by a vicious cycle of violence that sadly just never seems to end. It's easy to say that Kay Flock should have known better, because by the time he allegedly killed someone, he had hit songs, lots of money, a record deal and a bunch of designer clothes. But let's not forget he too was still a teenager, lacking guidance and lacking the proper understanding to navigate the gifts that he had been given over the course of his rise to fame. It's easy to say that he's a dumb criminal doing a drill in an expensive outfit and getting caught, but really he was the victim of a broken mindset before his success even kicked in. All he heard his whole life was kill or be killed no matter what. Perhaps he should have moved out the Bronx by that point in his fame, but perhaps no one had told him that's what he should do. Maybe he was kept there by pride, ego, or by simply not realizing that at that level of fame, he was no longer safe in his city anywhere. I just hope that at the very least, this video can be a lesson for the next generation of young men growing up in a difficult environment. That life is precious, and there's so much more to life than your block or your ops, and you don't need a record deal or a $3,000 outfit to realize that. Even when you're born into the most challenging environments, there's always a way out. But you have to make that decision to break the cycle of crime and violence so you can make it a different way. Whether it's through music, education, entrepreneurship, sports, or whatever your passion is. The only way to truly have a chance of surviving is breaking the cycle and being a shy example of what's possible. Sadly, it just doesn't look like K-Flock was able to do that in time. But I hope from here, many of the other names that we've mentioned in this story that still have their lives and successful careers in rap can make it out and live long, positive lives as artists. I hope you found watching this video interesting and educational. Thank you for giving me your time and watching it. And finally, rest in peace to all of the young men who tragically lost their lives over the course of this story.